Lecture number nine, the social dimension of the Buddha's teaching. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. In the past, Buddhism has often been subject to a common misunderstanding and misrepresentation. It has been viewed as an exclusively otherworldly religion, a doctrine directed solely to a transcendental goal without any concern for this world other than its abandonment. It is held by some writers that the only authentic way to follow the teaching of the Buddha is to renounce the world, to become a monk and retire to a forest or cave in order to practice meditation. In the view of these writers, the Buddha does not offer any teaching that is of relevance to man in the world, to people faced with the problems of day-to-day life that he holds out no principles for resolving the tangles and difficulties of social, economic, and political life. Theravada Buddhism, in particular, has been depicted in this distorted way as a teaching of an exclusively otherworldly nature, as an austere monastic code which encourages each individual's private pursuit of his own salvation and which does not even give a fleeting glance to the larger questions facing society. Now all of these charges, as we said, involve serious misunderstandings and misrepresentation. At the outset we have to stress that the ultimate aim of the Buddha's teaching is the transcending of the world. On this point there can be no hedging, compromise, or any need for apologetics. The ultimate aim, the highest aim of the Dhamma, is liberation from the round of birth and death, deliverance from samsara, because all life in samsara, in the world of becoming, is incomplete and unsatisfactory. It is all impermanent. It all involves suffering. It is without any substantial basis. But though the Buddha teaches that the transcendence of the world is the ultimate goal, he treats this goal in perspective, in relation to the totality of human life. For every aspect of human life is connected in some way to the other aspects. No aspect can be treated in isolation from the whole. Life in the world is not opposed to or unrelated to our spiritual quest, but it can become part of the path which leads to the achievement of deliverance. The Dhamma has two aspects, two dimensions, a dimension of depth and a dimension of breath. In its dimension of depth, the Dhamma leads to the overcoming of the world. But in its dimension of breath, of wideness, of extensiveness, It embraces all facets of human existence and it shows how all these different sides of human life can become transformed, elevated and ennobled, absorbed into the comprehensive path leading to liberation. We see both of these aspects illustrated in the life of the Buddha himself. 
Prior to his own quest for enlightenment, the future Buddha renounced the household life, the palace, and he went forth into homelessness to become a wanderer, a seeker of wisdom in the forest. And this move on his part teaches an important lesson. It teaches that renunciation and detachment from the concerns of the world at a certain point becomes an essential element of the path aimed at deliverance. And since the Buddha was a family man with wife and child and a prince who is destined to lead the country, this act of renunciation on his part teaches an important lesson. It teaches us that the quest for enlightenment has priority over all mundane social and political claims, that it is the paramount duty of man to seek his wisdom and freedom, and nothing can obstruct him from achieving the same. However, the life of the Buddha teaches us more, for after he reached his enlightenment, the Buddha did not keep his teaching to himself. He did not remain silent and withdrawn in the forest. But he came back into the world to teach and proclaim his doctrine to all people, to show all the way to release from suffering, to show all them the way to happiness. And in the course of his teaching mission, the Buddha associated with people from all walks of life. In his own words, he said, Very often I dwell surrounded by monks and nuns, by laymen and laywomen. I live surrounded by kings and princes, by businessmen and merchants, brahmins and recluses. He claimed that he lived and worked for the welfare of the entire world. To show the relevance of his mission, the Buddha says of himself in one sutta, in the Anguttara Nikaya, he says that if one could say of any one single person that he is born in the world and lives for the welfare of the many folk, for the happiness of the many folk, out of compassion for the world, for the good of all the world, it is of him, the Buddha, rightly speaking, that one could say this. And of course, since the Buddha is free from all pride and conceit, the statement has to be taken as completely objective, not a boastful utterance on his part. Then, to show the relevance of his teaching to people from all walks of life, the Buddha says, If my teaching could only be practiced by monks and nuns, but couldn't be practiced by laymen and laywomen, then my teaching would be defective in these two respects. It would be an imperfect doctrine for the reason that it couldn't be practiced by laymen and laywomen. But then he adds, because my doctrine can be practiced by all, by monks, by nuns, by lay by laymen, by lay women, therefore it is a completely perfect and pure doctrine. Now the teaching of the Buddha is said to lead to three types of benefits. That is, it leads to benefit in this present life, to benefit in future lives and it leads to the ultimate benefit, the ultimate good of human existence. The first or most elementary benefit of the Dhamma is called the present life benefit or welfare and happiness here and now in Pali, Dita Dhamma Sukhahita. This is the good, the welfare of men and women living in the world. The Dhamma is intended to promote this good, to promote economic, 
political and social justice, to promote personal well-being, happiness, and peace of mind right here and now, to conduce to friendly and harmonious relations between people. Then, at the second level, as the second good, the Dhamma conduces to future benefit, that is, to our benefit in future lives, because it shows us the way we can cultivate our karma, our actions of body, speech, and mind, so that as long as we are going to remain in samsara, we will be able to advance through our future lives, taking favorable forms of rebirth, forms that will aid us in our quest for final liberation. This benefit is called Samparaika Sukhahita, that is the good, the happiness, and welfare pertaining to the future. The third and highest benefit of the Dhamma, this is called the Paramatta Sukhahita, that is the achievement of ultimate welfare and happiness, the attainment of Nibbana or final deliverance. Now to give a fully adequate account of the Buddha's teaching, these three aspects or benefits have to be included, brought together. Emphasis upon one to the exclusion of the others will lead to a distorted representation. And that is just what has happened with most scholars who have focused only upon the third <coughs> the final benefit of the Buddha's teaching, the achievement of nirvana, and have tended to neglect the other two aspects, the welfare and happiness here and now, and the benefits in future lives. Though these are also essential to the total structure of the teaching, and these further form the basis for the attainment of the ultimate aim. The Buddha gives teachings and doctrines that lead to our benefit here and now, to material and social well-being. But all the good and benefits that come from the Buddha's teaching are set out in a graded order so that the benefit here and now, material and social well-being, is not the end or final goal of the teaching. The final and highest end of the teaching is the spiritual goal, the attainment of nirvana. From the Buddhist perspective, if we just seek material or economic welfare, then human life becomes degraded to the level of animal life. We become concerned only with eating, sleeping, reproducing, gaining pleasure with living in comfort and convenience. And to live in such a way insults the potential value of human life. The Buddha teaches that the economic and social stability that come even from the application of his teaching have to serve as the basis or foundation for our higher development for our development in the moral, spiritual, and intellectual spheres. And when we make the attainment of deliverance our goal and seek the application of that aspiration to the rest of our life, then the aspiration to the highest goal bends back, so to speak, to change and transform our economic and social life. So that these, instead of being pursued as ends in themselves, come to be recognized as having a secondary value, as laying the foundation for inner cultivation. Nevertheless, they are, though of secondary value, they are very important for the practice of the path. Since if we live in a society and culture which denigrates spiritual values, 
which rejects any claim of human life to moral dignity and worth, then it becomes very difficult, perhaps even impossible, for a person to develop along the Noble Eightfold Path. To be able to practice the Dharma properly, what is required is a secure material foundation, a peaceful and beneficent government, a free society which allows opportunities for spiritual exploration and practice. Thus we see these two aspects to be mutually supporting. Material well-being provides the support for spiritual development and the pursuit of the spiritual goal determines the form of the social order. Now in order to further appreciate the social application of the Buddha's doctrine, we have to be aware that there are two basic concerns which the practitioner has to apply to his teach to his practice. That is the concern for his own good and concern for the good of others. Theravada Buddhism sometimes has been portrayed as a self-centered doctrine, a doctrine which instructs us to seek our own well-being without any concern for the well-being of others. But if we go back to the earliest Buddhist texts, to the Pali Canon, we'll see that the Buddha often teaches that there are two types of good we have to take into account, two types of benefit, our own benefit and the benefit of others. For example, the Buddha teaches his own son, Rahula. He says, Rahula, before you act, before you speak, you should stop and reflect. You should ask yourself, will this action of mine lead to any harm to myself or any harm to others or any harm to both? If this is the case, you should avoid this action. But if you know when you reflect that this action will lead to my own true benefit or to, to, or to the benefit of others or to the benefit of both, then you should perform that action. Again and again the Buddha teaches, you should always reflect before acting, while acting and even after acting. Reflect on one's own benefit and the benefit of others. These two ends both justify action, both must be balanced and taken into account. And the same insistence on a balance of self-regarding and altruistic motives comes through in another statement of the Buddha. In one sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha says that there are four types of people found in the world. There is the person who is concerned neither with his own good nor the good of others. This person, the Buddha says, is the worst one of them all. He is like a stick which on one side is burning and blazing with fire, on the other side it's smeared with filth. So you don't want to grab hold of the stick on either side. If you take hold of the left side, you'll get burnt. If you take hold of the right side, then you'll get dirty. That is like the man, the person who is not concerned either with his own good or with the good of others. Then there is the person who is concerned with the good of others but not with his own good. And third, the person who is concerned with his own good but not with the good of others. These two are in the middle. Then finally, there is the person who is concerned both with his own good and the good of others. This person, the Buddha says, this fourth one, this is the best, the highest, the chief, and the most excellent. This person, the Buddha says, is like purified cream of ghee. That is, to get cream of ghee, you begin with milk, 
Then you turn the milk into butter. From butter you extract the ghee. When you purify the ghee further, then you get something called cream of ghee, which is supposed to be very delicious, very expensive also. And this fourth person, the Buddha says, this person is like the cream of ghee. But the Buddha also says that the concern for the welfare of others also has to be tempered by the recognition that we can only benefit others truly to the extent that we have benefited ourselves. In order to be able to help and assist others effectively, we first have to establish ourselves on firm ground. A man who stuck himself in the mud cannot help another get out of the mud. If he tries to do so, both will be stuck and both will sink down. In order to help somebody out of the mud, we have to be on firm ground ourselves. We have to be ourselves safe and secure. So therefore, to help and to benefit others in a true way, we have to seek our own true benefit as well by developing within ourselves the pure, high spiritual qualities which will enable us to benefit others. <coughs> now the particular applications of Buddhist social thought have firm roots in the doctrines of Buddhism. And to understand these social applications we should see the way they arise out of their foundation in the Buddhist doctrine itself. <clears throat> and the primary concept for understanding the social thought of Buddhism is the same concept which lies at the base of the entire Buddhist doctrine, that is the concept of Dhamma. The word Dhamma, as we've explained, means that which upholds, that which sustains. In its broadest sense in Buddhism, it signifies the cosmic law which supports all phenomena, the law of dependent origination, Paticca Samuppada. It covers also the law of the Four Noble Truths, the three characteristics of existence, and all the other particular ramifications of Buddhist doctrine. The concept of Dharma also has an ethical dimension. In its ethical dimension, it is the law of righteousness, the principle of virtue, of moral truth. Dharma here is the moral law which protects us, which upholds us, which safeguards us against spiritual degeneration, from the fall into lower states of existence and from the fall into samsara. It is the path of mundane spiritual development and the supramundane path which leads out of the round of birth and death. So the word Dhamma combines these two ideas, the philosophical idea and the ethical idea. It fuses them together into this one law of reality and virtue. Now this Dhamma, this one Dhamma, divides into many Dhammas in accordance with the different spheres of human activity. Now when, after a heavy rain, when there are many pools of water on the ground, then the one moon, when we see it reflected in the water, we see that it gives rise to many images of itself. And so we see many images of the moon. In a similar way, when this one all-embracing Dhamma, the cosmic moral law, is seen applied to the various domains of human activity, it produces or gives rise to many dhammas, many ideals of conduct, a 
appropriate to each particular situation. Thus, for example, there is the Dhamma of the monk, that is, the various ideal practices which the monk should undertake. There is the Dhamma for householders, the ideal way of conduct for a householder. The Dhamma for a father or for a mother, for a wife, for a husband, for members of the various social classes, and so on. Each type of individual has its own Dhamma. And to follow one's own particular Dhamma is to live in harmony with the universal Dhamma, the law of righteousness and truth. And it is out of this concept of universal Dhamma that all the particular duties and obligations of each individual in all aspects of social life derive. As we go on, we shall see particular applications of this concept of Dhamma to the different domains of human life and to the different types of human relationship. Another foundation for Buddhist social thought is the Four Noble Truths themselves, especially the Second Noble Truth, that craving and the other defilements are the origin of suffering. Usually we understand the Second Truth to teach that craving is the cause of our personal suffering, of our worries, anxieties, fears and sorrows, or else for our transmigration in samsara in the round of birth and death. But in some suttas, the Buddha also explains that the same craving becomes the source of suffering and misery in our social existence. For example, in the 13th sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya, the Buddha says that because of the craving for sense pleasures, the craving for sensual enjoyment, the father fights against the son, the son fights against the father, the mother fights against the daughter, family fights with family, household with household, social group with social group, nation with nation. He says that because of the desire and attachment for pleasures and for wealth, men put on armor, they take up their swords, they prepare their weapons, they go into battle, they fight each other and destroy each other and they kill each other. All of this, the Buddha says, comes about because of the craving for sense enjoyments. And unfortunately, it seems the modern world, to a large degree, bears ample testimony to this. <laughs> Again, in the 15th Sutta of the Diga Nikaya, the Buddha gives an interesting variation on the formula for dependent arising, Paticca Samuppada. After he has explained dependent arising all the way down to craving, he then declares that in dependence on craving there arises search, that is, searching for objects of craving. In dependence on search there arises acquisition, that is, you acquire the objects of craving. Then, in dependence on acquisition, there comes discrimination. You form the notion, this is mine, not yours. That's yours, not mine. Then, because of discrimination, there comes attachment and desire. One becomes attached to one's own possessions and desires the possessions of others. Then, in dependence on desire, clinging, possessiveness, and selfishness arise. Because of selfishness, there comes the sense of protectiveness, a kind of paranoia that makes you feel you have to protect your own possessions from the encroachment of others. Then, the Buddha says, in dependence on this sense of protectiveness, men take up their clubs, they take up their swords, they become involved in wrangling, quarrels, disputes, and false accusations in all sorts of unwholesome states. All of these the Buddha traces to their root in craving. And he says that if craving is eliminated, then all of these will be eliminated. Thus all these social problems come from the basic cause of craving. <coughs> 
The doctrine of egolessness, anatta, also implies certain principles of social ethics. Buddhism teaches that the idea of self is the root of suffering, since it lies at the base of all the selfish emotions and defilements which cause suffering. Therefore, to get free from this trouble, from the social turmoil that comes from the defilements, we have to uproot the sense of selfhood. And we uproot the sense of selfhood by beginning to act in ways which contribute to diminishing the grip of the self idea. Ultimately, the eradication of selfhood has to come about through wisdom, the wisdom that arises out of meditation. But meditation cannot be sealed off in a compartment of its own separate from the rest of our life. True wisdom doesn't arise while we are living outwardly in a selfish manner dominated by all sorts of selfish desires. To generate wisdom in meditation, we have to begin in little ways in our outward life by cultivating pure and selfless actions of body and of speech, by giving, by observing precepts, by helping and assisting others, and so forth. Then all of these little acts will build up a momentum that will diminish the inner clinging to selfhood and provide the foundation for wisdom to arise, the wisdom of selflessness that directly and intuitively realizes the absence of selfhood in all things. Still, another foundation for the social ethic of Buddhism lies in four high spiritual states to be developed in meditation. These states are called the Brahma-viharas, that is, the sublime states or the divine dwellings. The word Brahma means divine or supreme. The word vihara, a dwelling place. The four sublime states, the four Brahma-viharas, are loving-kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. The first, loving-kindness, that is in Pali, metta. And this is the wish for the welfare and happiness of others. As an ethical attitude, in a meditative state, it is to be developed to an immeasurable extent until it embraces all living beings, enfolding all living beings in infinite loving kindness, the wish for their welfare and happiness. The second Brahma Vihara is compassion, whereas loving kindness is the wish for the welfare and happiness of others. Compassion, or karuna, is the feeling of empathy with others, the quality that makes the heart tremble and shake with the suffering of others. This is the quality which makes us identify with others and feel their suffering as if it were our own. And when compassion works on us, then it arouses the desire to relieve and alleviate the suffering of others, to take away their, their misery and the causes of their misery. And like metta, this quality of compassion, of karuna, is to be extended immeasurably to all beings. The third divine dwelling is sympathetic joy. Mudita. Mudita is the quality of rejoicing in the happiness and good fortune of others. This quality tends to remove envy and jealousy and to arouse joy over the fortune of others. Then the fourth Brahma Vihara is equanimity. This is the attitude of impartial neutrality. The equality of mind that is extended towards all beings. 
Normally we tend to favor those whom we like and to dislike those who threaten us or disturb us. But when we develop upeka equanimity, then we cultivate a mind which does not discriminate between the close and the distant, but which looks with equal friendliness upon everyone, those who are agreeable to us and those who are hostile to us. So one with equanimity can look upon all beings without discrimination. These are four ethical attitudes to be developed first in meditation, but which can reach expression in concrete action in the social, economic, and political spheres. So far we've explained the foundations of Buddhist social thought. Now we'll discuss the applications of these principles to different areas of social concern. We'll take first the Buddha's teachings on economics. Now some modern schools of thought, like Marxism, regard the economic domain as the primary determinant of social existence and dismiss everything else beyond that as mere superstructure, a secondary overlay on top of the material conditions. Contrary to this view, the Buddha recognized that there are many interdependent spheres of human activity. These cannot be subjected to some, to some simplistic reduction, but they have to be seen as mutually efficacious, as interrelated. The Buddha took note of the importance of economics to human life, and he held that if people are to be capable of personal and spiritual progress, the economic foundation has to be secure. We have to be able to live a secure life materially and economically. In one sutta, the 26th sutta of the Dīgha Nikāya, the Buddha shows clearly how poverty can become a cause of social chaos and deterioration. He explains that in the distant past there were many virtuous kings who reigned over happy and prosperous kingdoms, and these kings provided for the welfare of their subjects by giving them all sorts of material and economic assistance. After several generations, one king arose in this lineage who neglected to take care of his subjects materially. He fulfilled all of his other royal duties, but he failed to give his people wealth when they were poor. As a result, poverty became widespread in the kingdom. Because of this poverty, people began to steal. Then the king, in order to counteract theft and robbery, he instituted punishment for those who stole he decreed that they would be punished with execution. As a result of this, when people were approached by the royal police, they would lie in order to avoid being arrested, or else they would murder the policemen who came to bring them to court. Then, from this murder and lying, all sorts of social evils broke out until complete chaos ruled in the country. So here we see that in the Buddha's view, the economic order becomes a determinant of the social and moral order. In the story, the king's failure to provide for the welfare of his people led to social disorder. And extending the principle further, the sutta seems to imply that if the governing body, whatever its form, be it kingship or anything else, if it does not ensure that the people are economically well off, that they're secure, the result will be chaos and confusion, even crime in society at large. 
And so here the Buddha teaches not only that economics to a large extent determines man's moral condition, but also that the government has the responsibility to correct any kind of extreme economic injustice. In another discourse, the fifth sutta of the Diga Nikaya, the Buddha describes another kingdom where a similar situation erupted. This time the king, rather than instituting some measure on his own, came to his advisor, a Brahmin, to seek advice. This Brahmin, of course, turns out to be the Bodhisattva, the one who is going to become our Buddha in some past life. So the king came to the Brahmin and he said to him, now there is pillaging and looting in my kingdom. To counteract this, I want to punish the thieves. Should I do this? The Brahmin advisor told him. He said, If you try to improve the situation by instituting punishment, that will only deal with the surface symptoms that won't strike at the underlying root. If you want to get to the root of the problem, you have to look after the well-being of your subjects. There are people in your kingdom who are farmers, who raise cattle and grow crops. To them you have to give feed for the cattle and grain for their crops. There are people in your kingdom who are merchants and businessmen. They don't have any money to run their business. That's why they're robbing. You have to give them capital to conduct their business. In your kingdom there are people who used to work in the government service as civil uh, servants, but you're not giving them jobs, they're unemployed, so they have to steal. You should give feed and grain to the farmers, loans to the businessmen so they can carry on their trade, and give jobs to the government employees, to the clerks. If you do this, then all these men will stop robbing and stealing, the royal revenue will go up, the country will be quiet and at peace. And then, the Buddha says, the people, pleased and happy, will live with open doors, dancing with children in their arms. From this, we can see that the Buddha gives very specific and practical advice on economic matters for improving the conditions of the country.